baseball and faith service uh, that we were going to do. And the thing was, yes, and we'll start with Jim playing, taking me out to the ball game. So uh, that's what we're going to do today. So that's what will be officially as we begin. So sing along. Sing along, please. Yeah.
Celebration of Life for Ronald Anthony Katona. We are here in this day to honor his life and, uh, you know, the, just the spirit in the room this afternoon. I mean, it felt like a Ron homecoming back there watching everybody. The different aspects of Ron's life and so many sides of him uh, are just going to be revealed today. You're going to hear stories you didn't know about Ron or sides about him or just things that are, of course, that's Ron. You know, just things that will just be uh, reminders and encouragement of the wonderful human being that he was and our thankfulness to share this earth with him on those days. Let us pray. Loving God, you have been with us throughout this life and you have been with us in the days that Ron has walked this earth. The love that he brought, the energy that he had, that compassion, that smile, the love of food, the love of people, the love of baseball, the love of life itself. We give thanks for that and ask that you would be with us as we are here at this time to honor that life, to give thanks for it, to see its impact on our lives, and to hope that we too can continue on this journey to making this world a more just, a more loving, and more compassionate world. Be with us in this time, O oh God, we ask. Amen. Our opening hymn is the Church's One Foundation. You'll find it in the black hymnal. It's number 386. May we stand and sing. Underneath your own.
church a table with several Bibles, a picture of Ron, and a pair of reading glasses. Um, and I hope that that was meant to symbolize in part his service uh, as the uh, leader of spiritual voyages. For 27 years, we think, Ron has been leading every two weeks the uh, a group called Spiritual Voyages, a Bible study group. And uh, it is it is just fascinating to imagine how many hundreds of people he has reached in his ministry through that, through Spiritual Voyages. And I'm privileged to have been one of them. Uh, and I know that there are a few uh, of the current members who cannot be here and they send their regrets to the family and condolences. Amen, brother. <laughs> My first reading is, the first reading is uh, John uh, chapter 14 verses 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. The second reading is from Romans, the first chapter, verses uh, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Good morning. I'm Louise Forseth, and I have known Ron for decades. And I have just uh, uh, two things. Uh, I, he was a strong advocate and clear wisdom understanding understanding of the Baptist principles, the four Baptist principles. And I remember one time when I was in my truck and I just walked my dog in the cemetery and it was snowing outside and I was just kind of waiting and to get out safely. And I decided to call Ron because what's been on my mind was a separation of church and state. And we we're a very strong separation of church and state and I was going in my mind really giving myself a lecture on this. So I decided to call Ron and give him the lecture. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine how well that went. <laughs> and the second one, uh, which I've uh, repeated to some of you before, was I knew a side of, of Ron that was so tender and so uh, intimate in a safe way. And uh, I have a health issue, and it's very difficult to understand and describe. And so, but it, it causes me uh, great distress. And uh, church is one of those places where it pops up. And I was over at the table where Shirley, looking at Shirley Doyle's pictures that she takes for our Christmas cards and other cards that she does, they're beautiful. And Ron came next to me and I was standing there because I was just in such misery. And Ron came next to me, not close, just next, just put his hand on my shoulder. And I said, that's probably the most intimate moment I've had in this church. So for my uh, reading today, it starts with Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guide your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The second one comes from Revelations, the last book of the Bible the 21st chapter, and it's verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. 
He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more, for the first things have passed away. I'm Diane Christofferson. About 36 years ago, I attended a free lunchtime lecture and discussion open to the public, facilitated by a woman faculty member at Metropolitan Community College on a topic explicitly related to feminism. We met in a blandly colored windowless room set up for seating for about 40 people in the shape of a rectangle the lecture was stimulating and discussion galvanizing. I couldn't help but notice that there was only one man in the room and that the questions he asked the presenter were thoughtful, humble, sincere, and yet well-grounded in complex understandings of the dominant culture's distortion of systemic relationships that tend to privilege men and disadvantaged women. One feminist man in the room. What a rare soul he must be, I thought. <laughs> Perhaps a month or two after attending the lecture at MCC, I attended the intensive weekend offering affiliated with the University of Minnesota's School of Medicine, the program in human sexuality. I believe the program was one of the first of its kind in the country, developed through the collaboration of physicians and theologians. Professionals in a variety of fields, social workers, therapists, community mental health clinicians, primary care doctors, clergy, as well as individuals working through their own issues, populated the ranks of the attendees. At the conclusion of the weekend intense of a man who had served as a small group facilitator stood at the door of the building where we had met and said goodbye as people were leaving. As I was heading toward the door, the man and I exchanged a few words. He said, you look familiar to me. And after a while of back and forth between us, trying to figure out where our lives might have previously intersected, we looked up to notice that by then everyone had left. So we took our conversation out the door and onto the sidewalk for perhaps another half hour. By then we had suspended our mutual search for the time, place, and circumstances of our first meeting, though we did figure it out later. It was at MCC. <laughs> and went on to an array of other topics before planning to meet for ice cream a week or so later. And so it has been these past 36 years or so, whether I lived in the Twin Cities or in some other state, or made a point of meeting up with him when I was back home visiting, whether we met in person or over the phone for long conversations, particularly when I was an over-the-road truck driver, Ron Catone was with me. He was the most ideal brother I never had. He was my parents' handyman and to my sister, the angel, who was with our mother when she died. I felt deeply seen and heard by him, intimately known and unconditionally loved, profoundly safe and respected, wholeheartedly encouraged, supported, and accompanied by him throughout all the adventuresome circumstances of my own unique journey in this life. It was not as though we didn't have our differences, though. As siblings, biological and chosen, always do. I mean, Ron wasn't a lesbian after all. <laughs> Ron was a systems thinker, and I suspect a whole-to-part thinker. 
His inexhaustible curiosity and spiritual disciplines contributed to his own methodical approach to applying insights to concrete human dilemmas that sharpened his expertise in a broad array of areas. From teaching courses on organizational development and higher education and serving as a business consultant, to increasing his abilities to throw a variety of pitches on the baseball mound in a mind game with people in the batter's box, to analyzing alternative fixes to the boiler systems in this very church, heating and air conditioning solutions, or any kind of building issue that someone might want to solve, to auto repair, to offering pastoral counseling and care to individuals, to serving as a facilitator and coach to professionals, to significant contributions to churches in transition, and to nonprofit boards in governance and management. Ron's qualitative, compassionate, non judgmental, egoless, other focused presence was just what was needed at Spirit of the Lakes United Church of Christ in a time of crisis when I encouraged him to apply for the position of interim co-minister, which he served with excellence. His skillfulness, patience, and good humor were always evident. Like when our softball team, composed mostly of gay men and lesbians who lived up to mostly our uh, uh, stereotypes, you know, and how we might play baseball. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, we hilariously lost our first game in this church league, 47 to 0. <laughs> the other teams who came from more conservative theological contexts likely didn't know what to make of us, but Ron was a great bridge as our coach among other coaches. His gifts and skills also seemed to me to fit the needs of the nonprofit organization Disability Awareness Ministries, as Reverend Suzanne Modest, my longtime United Methodist clergy colleague, transitioned back to parish ministry, and I suggested Ron apply to serve as the interim director. When Ron worked with churches and judicatories in this role, advocating for and facilitating more full inclusion of persons with disabilities, he really meant all persons who were marginalized. Parenthetically, Ron was my community advisor as I worked on my Doctor of Ministry degree, which also had to do with inclusion. In this case, the inclusion of sexual minorities in church and society. Well, Mary Jean Babcock, board member of Disability Awareness Ministries, shared a story of the resistance she and Ron received from a person in power with whom they had met. This church representative had insisted that the only thing they wanted was to make sure all of the people with disabilities had opportunity to receive the sacrament. And when Mary Jean and Ron uh, left that meeting and were in the parking lot of the church, Mary Jean could no longer co contain her fury at the apparent inability of the church representatives to envision broader inclusion and to break down attitudinal barriers that the church rigidly kept in place. Mary Jean wrote, I let loose with a barrage of expletives. Then there's mild-mannered Clark Kent. <laughs> he put his arm around me and said, we're going to get something to eat, and I'm going to buy you a drink. <laughs> Ron's compassion and kindness were ever-present. Intimately familiar with family systems theory as Ron was, I imagine somewhere along his journey, he would have deeply meditated on the following quotations from Henry Nouwen's book, The Wounded Healer. The main question is not, how can we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed? But how can we put our woundedness in the services of others? And this, 
when our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. And so he was. Ronald Anthony Catone, wounded healer whose life has transformed persons, all of us and those beyond us. A transformer of institutions to which we have belonged and beyond us. A transformer of the world in ways that will continue to bear fruit this day and into the future. So let's keep sharing stories today and in the days to come. Imagining Ron has invited us to the table of kinship, food and drink, and mutual blessing. He will cheer us on in the bonds of everlasting love. John, take us out to the ball game. Good afternoon, everyone. I feel very humbled and honored to speak about Ron Catone, our good friend and my baseball manager for nearly 25 years. I met Ron in 1996 when he was serving as an interim minister at Mayflower Church. And I see several of our Mayflower Church members here, uh, despite the fact that it's been many years since it's, uh, Ron served at Mayflower. It was a Sunday afternoon at a new member orientation where Ron showed up to greet the new members in his full Rockets baseball uniform. <laughs> of course, no surprise to many of you because Sunday evening is prime time for senior baseball. In a conversation after the session, Ron let me know a little bit about the Federal League and that I would be welcome to stop by and take a look. I came to the game that night, and I liked the vibe of grown men playing a kid's game again. Ron told me then and there that I had made the team. <laughs> Perhaps not too surprising, since there were only nine guys in a rocket uniform. <laughs> oh, correction, eight guys plus the pitcher's girlfriend who played right field. <laughs> I was hooked, reliving my youth, not with softball, no offense, uh, but that's a very poor substitute. This was actual baseball, and I owed it all to run. As I grew older and had kids, I brought them to the game, and we stayed after for what my girls called the talk out, sitting on lawn chairs and tailgates, having a brew or a soda. Sometimes we'd relive the games, but just as often we'd talk about life in general. Ron was a great listener, sitting there on a borrowed stadium chair, tending JB's barbecued shrimp and everyone else's brats on his tiny grill, having a laugh, making a stab at Andy's baseball trivia, talking quietly with friends as the sun set and the stars came out. It was Ron that made all of this possible for the Rockets and for many other teams in this league that he set in motion many years ago. Baseball was another one of Ron's many ministries. My favorite Rocket story was before my time, a story Ron loved to tell. It was 1994, and the Rockets were recruited to play the Silver Bullets Women's Professional Traveling All-Star Team that had just started out. This was a national traveling team. They were supposed to play men's professional minor league baseball teams. But they were so overmatched, they, they soon sought out amateur teams. And somehow the Rockets were contacted, I think through Brock and Dana Kicker, and Ron agreed to play them. They played in front of 5,000 screaming fans, <laughs> nearly all female, in Midway Stadium. The Rockets held their own, but a borrowed pitcher from another team had his own Rocket inning, walked in several runs, and the Silver Bullets won for the first and nearly the only time that summer. Afterward, their coach, ex-major league pitcher Joe Necro, told Ron 
we don't shake hands after games. <laughs> that did not make Ron happy. <laughs> I'd love to tell you that Ron coached the Rockets to the league championship year after year, but the reverse is true. <laughs> we weren't that good. And even when we played well, we had too many rocket innings. There were probably many factors for our lack of success. Maybe it was his unfathomable signs from third base coaching box that nobody on the team knew but Ron. <laughs> but, but I believe the main factor was that Ron's criteria for adding someone to the team was, do you love baseball, rather than can you hit a curveball? <laughs> also, he welcomed some misfits and oddballs to the team. And that was lucky for us, because here we all are. <laughs> we did, uh, let's see. Oh, we did win the championship one year, 2002. But I don't know that our championship year was any more fun than the rest. We enjoyed playing well, but win or lose, we all stayed after for the talk out to celebrate our good plays and shrug off our strikeouts or errors or base running mistakes. Hey, at least it wasn't softball. <laughs> and winning was not the main point at all, just the chance to go on playing the game. Ron gave his heart and soul to the Federal League Baseball uh, program. Ron was a spiritual man, and I believe baseball was a spiritual experience for him. He talked with reverence about going to Cubs games with his dad as a kid, all the smells and sights and sounds of Major League Baseball. He thought Father's Day was the perfect day to schedule a baseball game so that the Rocket Dads could bring their kids to see them play. Ron was a kind man and he had a good word for everyone. My kids still talk about how nice he was to them and how he made sure they got, that they got a soda after the game. He welcomed everyone with a friendly grin, and this picture captures that grin perfectly. Eventually, he was happy to turn over the reins to Adam and to Ben. He was glad to have them carrying on the tradition. For him, it was the camaraderie that counted. He still enjoyed the scorekeeping and talking to the guys on the bench. He often visited the opposing team's tailgate after the game not just to steal a beverage, but to share the love of the game with an ever-widening circle, a circle that he started in motion when he founded the league in 1986. The last time I played with Ron was one of the last games he played, I think, since COVID hit the next year, and then he moved to Phoenix for a time. The St. Paul Senators invited Ron to join them for an intra-squad game at beautiful CHS Field in downtown St. Paul. I was playing a member uh, as a member of the Senators 50 plus team, so I picked him up. We were both so excited and we talked baseball all the way. Ron would have been happy just to watch, but the Senators saved the last frame for Ron to take the mound. He pitched a shutout inning. Ron loved playing the game, watching the game, managing the game, talking about the game. He loved the guys who loved the game. I know he also loved his church. He loved tinkering with old trucks and vans. At least I hope he did because he had to do it a lot. <laughs> Brian was not a hater, but there were some things he hated. He hated metal bats, so he did something about it. He started the Hickory Tournament, where only wooden bats could be used. The crack of the wood bat eventually replaced the ping of metal and that was good. Soon the Federal League banned metal bats. He hated the 10-run mercy rule, even though it was designed for teams like the Rockets and, and the church softball team, too. I think. He would always push to play the entire game if he could. I believe he would have hated the very idea of a pitch clock to speed up the game. If you guys remember, Ron was never in a hurry when he was on the mound. He hated intolerant behavior, but was always willing to give a guy another chance. I didn't get to play for Ron the last three to four years as I had moved to the over 50 league. Ron could have restarted his playing career in the older league, 
We thought he would jump at the chance to join us there and stay on the field, but he never showed any interest. The Federal League was his home, his creation, where he belonged. Several years ago, I started a tradition of inviting current and retired Rockets over to my house for a World Series game with a grill out and a potluck, sort of an indoor talk out. Ron would plop down his quart of Kowalski's potato salad on the kitchen counter and then his, take his place of honor in front of, the TV, in front of the TV on what came to be known as the Hall of Fame couch. Ron was the, the first Hall of Famer from the Federal League. That tradition ended during COVID. This past fall, I thought maybe the time was right to invite the kid, the guys over again. I got too busy to do it, and now it's too late. I'm sorry for that, Ron. It was my loss, and it was our loss. They like to call soccer the beautiful game. We all know that baseball was Ron's beautiful game, our beautiful game. And next, and next fall, Ron, We'll leave a spot for you on the couch, along with the one in our hearts. Well done. Well done. I don't have the pedigree of 20, 30 decades, uh, <laughs> not decades, but 20, 30 years. Um, I met him recently, and when you meet someone later in life, you miss decades of their past. So you take stories from what you've heard, and you marry them with your own experience, and you come up with a more complete essence of the person. This is what I know Ron Catone to be. These are my memories of a special servant. Ron was a beautiful, beloved man who had a gentle soul and a brilliant mind and a humble heart of a servant. Ron lived an extraordinary and rich life with many friends, strong, long-lasting relationships, and a deep and abiding love for God, his word, and his church. Ron walked the walk. I am blessed to have spent the last year and a half with him. I hired Ron to be my handyman after he returned from Arizona the summer of 2021. The first project was to patch some concrete steps. When I observed Ron work, because as a person that's going, what's the handyman doing? What's he finding? And you never want to hear this, um, <clears throat> can I see you for a minute? Because then you know it's going to be a big project. And he was charging by the hour. So when I observed him work, I saw an artist. I saw careful, deliberate movement, artful. To do that, you'll need to be online. <laughs> okay. uh, let's see, where was I? Artful uh, craftsmanship as Ron mixed and applied the cement with his various tools. As the day got colder, darker, and wetter, Ron continued to work in the cold rain, not rushing, right? not rushing or hurrying, even though he was running late for the Bible class that he was leading. When I got the bill for the two-hour job that took eight hours, he only charged me for two because he said, I didn't want to break my word. Well, from that single interaction, I learned that Ron was a talented artisan, a skillful craftsman, and a man of integrity and exceptional character. He was a man of faith, which was also a very attractive quality to me. I also noticed, even though he was wearing full-on Menards wear, two or three shirts, a hat, and two COVID masks, he had very kind eyes. When doing projects together, I found Ron to be an all-in type of guy. I was expected to be an active participant. We began with a Google search, we watched YouTube videos, and downloaded user manuals. Then we got to work. 
Ron loved teaching and explaining, especially handyman splaining. <laughs> So in during, during all these projects, I actually learned a little bit about engineering principles, ancient Roman aqueducts, <laughs> and thermodynamics. I'm sure I could go ahead and pass my PCHEM test now. We shared many meals and long discussions of theology, logic, numbers, you name it. And we quickly found common and complementary ground. For example, Ron loves to eat, and I love to cook and bake. <laughs> Ron appeared to my inner nerd. I was exposed to sections of Menards other than Christmas decorations, <laughs> to Harbor Freight, and to computer stores. Our first nerd date was a few hours at Micro Center, followed by dinner, and then hours of reading and discussing one of Ron's favorite books by Leonard Nelson on the Socratic method. <laughs> Ron texted me the next day and said he had something for me to commemorate the evening. When he arrived the next day with a crumpled paper bag, he looked like a kid going to show and tell. But when I opened it up, there was a nicely wrapped iPhone stand. You see, Ron remembered from our talks that I had said my hand had gotten sore a few nights before holding my iPhone for two plus hours while watching the Met Opera live stream. <laughs> You see, Ron was thoughtful like that, and he remembered everything he ever read or heard. It was useless to correct or contradict him because he was always right. As facilitator of spiritual voyagers, Ron shared his exhausted knowledge of scripture, history, Greek, Hebrew, and logic. So as we as participants received instruction worthy of that of any given by a university theology professor. Ron sent out notes prior to class, which challenged us to stretch our minds, reimagine, and go with our gut. Ron added depth and detail to the verses as he framed scripture with historical context. Ron made a commentary at the end of every lesson where he often emphasized Jesus feeding the hungry, curing the sick, and including the marginalized. Ron was big on inclusion. By the way, an aside, some of you have heard or read John Pentland's book. He would agree. I just, for some reason today, was flipping through that book, and on page 71, John Pentland says, For me, if Jesus was about anything, he was about inclusion. Ron's ahead of his time. The Bible study was only one of the places where Ron's comforting, compassionate nature was evident. Many of you have been the recipient of Ron's gentle care. Ron was always there for anyone who was hurting or grieving. Ron had occasions to comfort me this past year as well. When Sister Dawn's cancer returned after an 18-year remission, when I unexpectedly lost the job I'd held for 21 years and along with it my identity as a productive worker, and when my dad passed away this summer from Parkinson's. Ron was never too busy to give me a hug, say words of comfort, or give me a phone call. Ron's empathy and compassion were among his greatest and well-known attributes. But Ron needed more time. Ron wanted to read everything, teach everything, learn everything, fix everything, and be there for everybody. Ron always put himself last. He had a servant's heart. Ron loved God and his church and fervently served both. Besides his loving care of the physical parts of this church, Ron served on several committees and he would spend hours preparing for a committee meeting, then attend it, and then talk with members afterwards, sometimes for hours. As you've heard, Ron had many interests and passions. He was diverse and complex, yet he lived simply by only two rules. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's it, love God in the church and love others. Ron was a faithful servant who was the hands and feet of Christ. Now I'll close with a few words about Ron's final weeks and days. 
People have thanked me for being so kind to Rod, for taking such good care of him, for my friendship with him, and for my extraordinary efforts on his last days. Here's what I know and feel. When I met Rod, the capable servant, I sensed that he also needed to be served, uplifted, encouraged, and be given affirmation, which I did gladly and automatically with no hesitation. So I basically have been thanked for what came very naturally for me and what was easy for me, for loving him. When Ron was at HCMC, there was no other place I could have been or wanted to be but by his side. I was graced with his presence, inspired by his life, and I was amazed by this gentle, compassionate man who was put in my path. I am so grateful that I had that time I had with him. It was my honor to love that man. And I believe that Ron is exactly where he wants to be right now, dwelling on high with God, invited and included into mystic, sweet communion with our Heavenly Father.
Thank you, Diane, for that. The lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Luke. This is chapter 24, verses 13 to 27. This is the uh, Goodspeed translation. He was a uh, Chicagoan and a Cubs fan, so Anabaptist, so those, uh, all that Holy Trinity uh, for from Rome. Uh, this is a story that, that the two, if you remember there, if you don't know the story, it's all right. It was two disciples. It's after the resurrection. They're, they're walking back home. And the resurrected Jesus appears to them. That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking together about these things that had happened. And as they were talking and discussing the, them, Jesus himself came up and went with them, but they were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is all this you are discussing with each other on your way? They stopped sadly, and one of them named Cleopas said to him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know what happened there lately? And he said, What is it? They said to him about Jesus of Nazareth, who in the eyes of God and of all the people was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, and have a high priest, and our leading men gave him up to being sentenced to death and had him crucified. But we were hoping that he was to be the deliverer of Israel. Why, besides all this, it is three days since it happened, but some women of our number have astonished us. They went to the tomb early this morning and could not find his body, but came back and said that they have actually seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our party went to the tomb and found the things just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and slow to believe all that the prophets have said. Did not Christ have to suffer before entering upon his glory? And he began with Moses and all the prophets and explained to them the passages all through the scriptures that referred to himself. When they reached the village to which they were going, he'd acted as though he were going on, but they urged him not, and said, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is nearly over. Thus ends the lesson. I try to compile all of the ways that I knew Ron. I did this a few weeks ago after church, and I just I gave it the four sides of Ron. Uh, but I sat down this morning and last night and the past few days and just kind of go over it. I'm up to about 14 sides of Ron. <laughs> and there's more. I haven't exhausted it at all. But I just want to share some examples of Ron because he was a complicated person. And he had different sides and he didn't reveal himself to all people. There was sweater Ron. If you knew Ron, he would come in a sweater. And he, he loved to wear a turtleneck with a sweater. And this was the charming Ron. This was the magnetic Ron. This was the compassionate, the handsome. You know, that intentful listener. I mean, he could just woo people with just that attention that he would give you. And those beautiful eyes. This was a Ron you loved to be around. He just made you feel like a better human being. Contrast that with what I call gutter Ron. You know? This was a Ron who, was, who would be in full work gear, covered in grease and dirt and sweat and tired and loved every minute of it. There was also what I call filibuster Ron. <laughs> Everyone here agrees. <laughs> Senator Byrd from my home state had nothing on Ron. <laughs> if there was something that Ron didn't like, if we were moving too fast, you could not get a word in. He would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk until finally, okay, Ron, right? <laughs> It's, it, it, it fits to Ron's sense of time. I mean, all of us, you know, in, in the Bible, there's two senses of time. You know, there's like the kind of chronological time, and there's kairos. But there was this third dimension of time that Ron had. 
I mean, he didn't operate on our time schedule. How many of you, this is, there's another Ron here in a little bit. How many of you got an email from Ron at 3.24 in the morning? And it would be like 18 pages long. There was baseball Ron, which we've heard about, which we love. I shared this a few weeks ago, but I'll share it again. It's a great story. You know, I only played one season with the Rockets. Again, like, like John said, there was no tryout. It was just, could you walk? I think that was more of the thing. Uh, and so, you know, Ron, this is the only time that, um, uh, the only place where Ron, you know, it, Ron had very kind of clear boundaries of life. He never called me by my name. It was only pastor. The only time he called me Travis was on the baseball diamond. He was a manager. Uh, I was a catcher. He would never um, call off if I made a call for you know, a, a pitch. He would never dispute it. He would just always pitch what I called him. We're in, a, we're in the last season, the last one of the last games of the season. Uh, it's one of those, it's hot, it's dry. It's kind of one of like, you know, that kind of long season, even uh, not everybody comes to every game and people are calling to make sure they're coming. It's a doubleheader. I couldn't make the first game. It's down in Lonsdale and Ron's calling me. Are you coming? And I'm like, I'm on my way. Give me like another 10 minutes and I'll be there. So we show up uh, and there's only nine guys. And Ron didn't want to pitch, but he had to. And uh, this team is just, you know, just wiping the floor with us. And um, it's about the fifth inning. And there was this kind of young stud, you know, the, uh, who was his first year in the, in the league, and the guy could just really play everything. And um, he had, he'd already, hit, you know, he was three for three for, against Ron. And I said, look, when this guy comes up again, the last thing we're going to do is throw him a fastball because he is just killing you on these. Now, Ron's fastball was about 56 miles an hour, just you know. Uh, I mean, the guy was up there. Come on. I mean, I'd hope that I could pitch that fast at that age. And uh, so Ron had a vast array of junk pitches, and they were wonderful. He's the only person I know that still threw a screwball. And uh, so this guy comes up the bat. It, you know, we, Ron is able to get him to, th to a 3-2 count, and we think, we're okay, we're going to get this guy. So it's just junk pitch after junk pitch. You know, it's a screwball, it's a changeup, it's a fast, you know, it's a, it's a curveball, it's whatever he can throw. Uh, and the guy just keeps fouling him off. We get to the 17th pitch. <laughs> you know, Ron is exhausted. The batter is, is, is mad as all because this guy's getting him. And I call a fastball. Ron gives it everything he's got. You know, maybe he got up to 58 miles an hour. Whatever it was, <laughs> the guy froze. Right down the center of the plate. Strike three! You know? <laughs> the guy slams his back there. Walks off, he's totally pissed off, you know? <laughs> uh, a couple of days later, I call him and we're talking about it, and, he, and I said, and I recounted every pitch. And he was like, you know, I didn't really pay much attention to that. I was like, oh, okay. A year later, he acts like I never told the story and walks through every single pitch. <laughs> There was scholar Ron. You know, this was a guy who loved the Greek New Testament, who loved it, you know, his Princeton days. Ah, oh, he loved those days. He, he would sit there and talk to me about, do I remember when Bernard Anderson taught this about Genesis? I'm like, Ron, what year was that? Uh, but he would talk like it was just the other day. And he loved his continuing study. You know, he, like, again, like time-wise, it took him forever to read a long book because he would slowly read every word and digest it. But he loved that continual education process. You know, there was what I call mysterious Ron. You know, he kept many things to himself. Uh, and there are many times where we would be like telling a story about Ron, and you would see someone who's known him forever, like, what? I didn't know that about him. Uh, but he just kept things to him. He wasn't secretive. He was just personal. Just how he ran. It almost added to the depth of him that he kept these things to himself. There was cultural Ron. You know, I mean, I don't know if you ever walk, if you listen to if the NPR classical music, but they have kind of like a name that tune kind of thing. Uh, and I would always, you know, if we have, Eileen in the office would have classical music playing, I would have it in my office. And it would, it would, he would always kind of pop in around name that tune time. It didn't matter what it was. Ron knew, that, Ron knew it right off the bat. Oh, that's a Schumann piece from, you know. What? <laughs> and, uh, or I'd love it when the announcer would be like, there's no way you're going to get this one. Right, and Ron would walk in, boom. Yeah. He had a nice thing. There was conversational Ron, right? I mean, he was a great conversationalist. Loved to talk. The only problem for me was, you know, I, I like to leave the church around 5 o'clock. 
but we're talking about run time, right? The guy didn't get up till about six in the morning. You know, he didn't go to bed till six in the morning. Sometimes got up around one and starts moseying around. He would show up at my office at four forty-five, <laughs> and I would just simply text Lori, "Ron's here." <laughs> And you all know what that means, too. <laughs> you know, Ron, Ron didn't have kids, but Ron took it very seriously that all the youth here at Judson were his kids. And he kept tabs on them and asked questions about them and always knew about them. And I don't know how many times a kid would come up to me and say, Travis, there's this older man who just asked me some really serious questions. Ron? Yeah, is that his name? Yeah. There was a lover of nature, Ron. Uh, he loved to tell a story about when he was in Princeton and he was uh, a chaplain for the summer at Yellowstone Park. And during the middle of one of his sermons, an elk walked up. And he just said, well, hey, fellow, and just kept on with the sermon. He told the same story. He had the same reaction. I don't know if you may remember, but a few years ago, a squirrel was in his house. And he was sitting there reading, and the squirrel chewed through the wall right when he was uh, sitting there. And he looked at him and said, hey, fella. And then the squirrel went back. There was what I would call Pastor Ron. You know, and this was the, the um, this is a Ron, I think, that this was one of those that really, that really hurt. And then, I mean, you know, he mourned that his family's branch, you know, kind of Danish Baptist church, did not merge with the American Baptists, like Jerry Larson, another person of the same heritage, did. He often wondered how his life would have been a little bit different if they would have become American Baptist, and he maybe could have lived out his ordination in a different way. He loved his interim ministry. He loved, you know, uh, um, Spirit of the Lakes was, was his Camelot, and he called it that. He also told the story about, um, you know, the, uh, you were talking about the uh, gay and lesbian softball team. Uh, he said the hardest that anyone ever threw a ball to him was when he was playing shortstop and there was, he said there was a lesbian center fielder that just threw it on a rope right at me. And I've never had my hand sting like that. <laughs> he loved his interim ministry at Mayflower. And, you know, we got at Judson, we have to thank Ron because after he finished his interim ministry, he brought a few people to, from Mayflower here. So um, he was an evangelist in a different kind of way. <laughs> I tried to get Ron to do more interim ministry. I thought it was his gift. Uh, but every time he'd be like, well, you know, who's gonna like, pay attention to the boiler? And who's yeah. going to serve on the property committee or spiritual voyagers? I said, hey, we can work those things out. You've got a real calling here. Think about this, but he, he wouldn't do it. And that brings me to Latin. This was the wounded Ron. The wounded Ron. You know, his wounds, on the one hand, were numerous, and they made him apprehensive. He was never in a hurry. It was really hard to make snap decisions, whether he was on a pitching mound, or in a church committee, or with just another person. But his wounds also, um, I think, is that's where Ron's real power was. He had power in his wounds. And that's why I chose the story from Emmaus. This is a, a wounded community that finds new life. The resurrected Jesus appears to the disciples. And is it a text about the disciples knowing Jesus, will they continue on with how they were doing with what Jesus taught them? Is it a story about God abandoning the early church? Is it a story that reveals that even though the people are going back to Jerusalem, will they continue on their old ways? There's just so many, there's so many questions about it. But they invite Jesus to, to, to eat with them, to spend time with them, and in return, Jesus opens up the scriptures to them. And in essence, isn't this what Ron did in his life? He kept his heart open and soft enough to be transformed, to never give up on people, to eat a good meal, and open up the scriptures. 
You know, more than anything, I think Ron's legacy is wrapped up in this Emmaus story. It was part of his wounds. Somewhere in his life, the Bible was used for it to be an oppressive document and not a liberative one. Somewhere in his life, he was told, or in some ways, implicitly or explicitly, you know, that his call, his ordination, was not real. And because of this, Ron never gave up on other human beings. And he tried his best to show a way that others could be transformed. If you look at the people around Ron, all of us included, there's always wounded people around. Wounded people sometimes attract wounded people. He didn't try to fix people. But he knew that if he had given enough people love and care and community, healing will come. So one day, Ron introduced a friend of his to me. After the person left, Ron said, look, the person's going to be difficult to get along with. Just don't give up on them. Just stay with them. It took a few years. One day this person shows up in my office and just says, it happened. I'm healed. A few days later, I, I saw Ron in the boiler room. I said, hey, Ron, the friend that you suggested, they were here. They shared with me they're healed. Ron hugged me. We just cried together for a little while. The last few years of Ron's life were difficult. The isolation and fear of COVID was hard on him. The death of his mother, you know, the online, being a, a, the separation of online community devastated him. He craved community. He craved meeting people face to face. He, he went into this difficult and sad place. I wouldn't say depressed, but I would say melancholy for sure. Now, we all talked to him about it. I was like, Ron, you're just not yourself. But he refused to acknowledge it. Just kind of shook it off. I, I, I don't really know what you're talking about. But we didn't give up on Ron. And then over the course of time in this time, you know, Ron met Dana. And Ron discovered that you could, via Zoom, connect with people such as his brother Gary, coming to the Spiritual Voyagers. And over the last few months, I started to see little parts of Ron coming back. He started smiling again. He started telling stories again. Two weeks before he died, there we were. Sweater Ron was full there. He had a glass of red wine a giant plate of food. <laughs> One thing we didn't talk about was how in the world can anybody take a five inch paper plate of food and fill it that full and walk across the room without spilling anything? <laughs> but there he was with this big plate of food, glass of red wine, a fire, and we talked for two hours about liberation theology about West Virginia politics, about the concept of land in the Old Testament. Ron was back. Ron was back. That's what makes his death so tragic for us. He was back. He was back. But in some ways, his death was just so much like Ron. He never worked the room to say goodbye just kind of disappeared. But he was right there, and then all of a sudden he's not. When we were there in the room in the hospital, we were praying, we were just being with him, loving him, giving him all the love energies we had. And then all of a sudden he just stopped breathing and we didn't even notice it. It just got quiet. And he slipped away from us, disappeared again. 
We all loved Ron, as difficult and stubborn as he was. We loved him because he didn't give up on us. Because he tried to make sure that we didn't experience the pain that he experienced in his life. He tried to open up the scriptures to us. And for those moments and movements of breath, we are thankful. A rabbi told me recently that my mom used to tell her, she said that one day God will make each of us and the world perfect. Our job is to work to make that change as small as possible. I think Ron tried to do that with all of us. He is free from pain. I'm confident that he is healed. And we, on this side of the Jordan, we will continue to seek our healing too. So Ronald Anthony Cotone, for all that you did and for all that you were, we give you thanks. Amen. We're going to uh, stand and sing the hymn, Let All Things Now Living. This was the uh, song that Ron, uh, his letting go song uh, at Mayflower. Something with heat pumps, you know, maybe. Uh, is it going to be something maybe like to send a student to help for a Baptist, to study Baptist theology? Maybe. You know, we haven't decided yet, but just know there is something that we are working on. Um, I've even proposed that we name it the Bron Catone Boiler Room. Uh, 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 yes, yeah, I mean, this is a, the man's 
spent more hours on there. I should have said it in my thing. He never gave up on people, and he never gave up on heat pumps. Um, also, the, the city of Bridgefield, there is a, in the works a day of proclamation for our Ron Catone that will happen around uh, starting baseball season. So we'll have more information on that and uh, be on the lookout for that. But accommodation, I mean, here we are, uh, you know, Ron died in November, and here we are in uh, January with a funeral service, memorial service, um, and that seems fitting too. It's a long goodbye. Ron had a really hard time with goodbyes. And who doesn't? It's the hardest thing a human being could do, hellos and goodbyes. The rest of the stuff is easy. But here we are to commend Ron uh, into God's eternal arms and to say goodbye. So let us commend him. God, take now this faithful servant. We have been blessed to have him in our lives. He has transformed us. He has helped us to be better people. But now it's time to say goodbye. To put him into your eternal care. May light perpetual shine upon him, both now and forevermore. Amen. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, those from the north, south, east and west, those who are gathered here on this day, may the love of God continue to be with you. May that unending spirit that does not give up on people continue to find a place in your hearts. And may you continue on this journey of healing and transformation. Amen. After the postlude, you uh, all are invited downstairs to uh, uh, reception uh, in the fellowship hall. The finance committee has been um, diligently preparing this along with a host of others for hospitality. And we are thankful for that. I invite you to continue sharing Ron's stories, uh, continue to eat, have some smiles on your faces, comfort one another, and find some joy in our presence together.